Okay, so this morning we're going to talk about torts, and then we're going to do a little bit about insurance. Um, did you guys, I, I didn't send out the, the slides until last night. My week has been kind of insane. Um, so did you guys all get the slides? Okay, good. Uh, my understanding is, I know that the audio, and I don't know if anybody's gone back and tried to listen to any of the audio. I think there was a couple people that asked. It's not up yet. There were some technical difficulties, but they're working on it. And my understanding is that um, all of the uh, lectures, including today's lecture, they should be up by Monday. So if you need to go back and listen, I told them, I'm like, I understand, but we, we definitely have to have everything in shape by next week because people are going to be gone. So, but it, it sh they, they should be up if you guys want to go and listen to anything. Not that you need to listen to me twice, you know, in a month, but just in case, they, from my understanding, everything will be up. And then for the people who will be listening to this later when they're studying for the ARES, it'll already be up. Um, all right, so I, I've explained to you guys before torts. torts so there's, in, in, in the law, other than the criminal side, there's basically the commercial law, which is contracts and, and deals, and then on the, on the personal injury side is torts. That's where you get an injury and everything else. So that's relevant, obviously, to construction because people get injured. Um, there can be construction accidents. Um, sometimes it's a design professional's fault. Sometimes it's a contractor's fault. Sometimes it's nobody's fault. Act of God, other things. But you need to understand a little bit in torts for, you, for what you guys need to do because um, one, of the, one of the roles that an architect will play uh, in the course of a construction project, after the drawings are done, is construction administration. Now, that's not construction management. There's a difference between the management side and administration. Construction administration that an architect does is when they're on the project site, they will observe to make sure that the work is being performed in accordance with their drawings. They're not going to tell the contractor how to swing the hammer, how to rivet the bolt, how to, to do what needs to be done and how the construction works. That's called means and methods. Architect has nothing to do with that and doesn't want to have anything to do with it. Safety. The architect is not responsible for safety, and we'll get into that more today and then when we go to the B101. Um, but at the same time, uh, you're still out on the project site. So these issues of safety still come in, and, and how do you balance that between what your job and your role is? Because you want to make sure the project site is safe. And so when you're on there for construction administration, things like potential accidents and, and areas where there could be an accident when you see how the construction site is being kept may come into question. And so you want to make sure you keep yourself and your company that you work for safe and free, hopefully from lawsuits involving torts where someone's been injured. So we'll talk about that and explain how that all works in this. The other element that kind of factors into this is, is this overriding theme of what you guys are supposed to do in your practice is you're practicing in accordance with the standard of care. And the standard of care, conceptually, is a negligent standard, which has to do with torts and potentially whether you're acting negligent or not. But it's contractually obligated to you because it's written to the contract. The contract says you must perform in accordance with the standard of care, and whether the architects performed in the standard of care, they look to see whether you're negligent or not. Which is so it's it's this one unique area where the blending of torts and contracts come together. And, You'll, you'll kind of get and understand a little bit more of that as the semester goes on, and I give you more examples. But let's walk through just now what, what we have here. Okay. So first, the definition of a tort and, and how it applies in here. The tort, a tort, is the duty owed to society and imposed by law to act in an acceptable manner. Not, not necessarily that the tort is the injury, but you have this negligent standard. You have to you owe this duty to society. Everybody, you have to act in a reasonable and responsible manner. And then, what's the difference between, conceptually, what's the difference between a loss due to a breach of contract, which we talked about for the last couple of weeks, and a loss due to a tort? Well, at the end, there's no difference because the remedy is probably going to be, in most cases, money. Now, we talked a little bit about last week, about there's these non-monetary remedies, like, um, like a specific performance, or an injunction, but most of the time, if someone's injured, we all hear about these huge lawsuits your company comes in, and they get millions of dollars. Or, if there's a breach of contract, the remedies, as we learned last week, is whether it's restitution, whether it's um, reliance, whatever the type of remedy you get, it's to get compensation for your loss. So, in one sense, there is no difference at the end, because there's a loss by both parties, 
and there's a recovery in cost. However, in a breach of contract, whether there's someone has suffered a loss, whether there's a breach, it's defined by the obligations between the two parties. So you may have a situation, if remember we went through the elements of, of contracting, you have to have the duty, but the duty in the contract, what you owe to the other side, is specific in that contract. So if the contract is silent, you can't, the other party can't say, well, you failed to do X, and I suffered a loss because of that, when the contract only said, I only have to do A, B, and C. As long as I performed A, B, and C, if the other side suffered because X didn't happen, I have not breached the contract, they don't have a claim against me, whatever monetary damages and soft losses they ever had, it doesn't matter because whether there's a breach is defined by the obligations between the two parties. Tort is not based on a contract. A tort is the, how did you act? How did you act to the other side? How did you act to the public at large? And then the overlap, like I said, the overlap, we'll talk about this in a second, what the economic loss rule is, but the reason why we have this concept of negligence and torts is because of this. So you enter into a contract as an architect with an owner to design a building. In that contract, the owner says, your designs must be in accordance with the standard of care. So you now contractually owe the owner that you will act not negligently. You will not be negligent in your actions. You will act in accordance with the standard of care. You owe that duty to the owner, but only the owner for the contract. Now, construction workers out on the site, the electrician is out there. And something happens and that electrician gets injured. And maybe the electrician is injured because of the way your designs were. Maybe some part of your design, the way you did the column and beam system, and they were working on the second floor and there's a collapse because your design didn't take in the loads sufficiently. And it may not be the loads that had the building where it was completed because you've got to think about when you're designing a building, you can't design it and say it's going to stand up when it's finished. You have to say it stands up while it's being constructed, too. So there's elements that you've got to think about that. A lot of that goes in the contract, but you still have to figure that out. So this electrician falls and is injured. You don't have a contract with that electrician, so that electrician cannot sue you for breach of contract. Contractually, in writing, there's no agreement. You don't even know who this electrician is. You've never heard of this individual. Yet she is injured, and she needs to have recovery. It's not the owner's fault. The owner just pays the bill. It's not the contractor's fault because the contractor didn't design. It's the architect's fault. Or maybe it is the contractor's fault and maybe the electrician doesn't work for the contractor that built the column and beam system. Whatever it is, the concept of negligence and tort is created so that that injured electrician, she has a right of recovery. And she can bring the claim for a tort, an injury or a loss suffered by her, due to the negligence of the architect or the contractor or whomever ultimately was responsible for the injury she suffered. And that, figuring out who was responsible, who committed the negligent act, whether it was negligent construction or negligent design, is a lot of area where I come into play because we hire experts and we try to figure out was the design proper, was it built properly, was it a combination of both, who has more or less fault, all those other things. But that is all a kind of a battle over here as to who was right or wrong because she was injured as a result of that. So that's why we have this concept of tort is because we don't all walk around with contracts with each other. You guys, if you're injured, should get a recovery. You shouldn't have if you break a leg or if you fall and get injured such as, you know, I've had death cases, I've had close head injury cases. If you suffer a loss, you didn't need to have a contract to be able to be compensated for it. That's the system that we live in. And so that's why we have torts. And that's why you guys need to understand that. That there's this difference between what's the obligation in the written document and what's what you owe generally to society at large. Okay? Does that make sense? All right. What's this overlap here, this last thing? The overlap between negligence and contract and tort. So there's this area where maybe it's not... An injury necessarily to someone that's been hurt, because you don't need a contract, but maybe there's like, so I had a case where the architect designed um, a, a townhome, a series of townhomes, 
and there was um, the way they designed the, the parapet wall and how the water how the water was supposed to drain out of it. It actually got in behind the parapet wall, went into the windows, went down to the window frames, and then leaked into people, the unit owners of the, of the condo. And so they lost the people. The, their drywall was soaked. There were a lot of warped floors because all this water came in from the way the architect designed the parapet up top. So the architect owes a duty to the developer, because that's who the contractor was with, to design in accordance to standard care. Of course, a leaky roof or a leaky parapet wall is not in accordance with the standard care. So there's an argument that the developer could make a breach of contract against the architect for losses. So here's what happens when you have, and this is a quick side for real estate, when you buy a condo, you buy it from the developer and you have a contract with you and the developer. You don't have a contract with the architect. Once all the condos are sold out, the developer kind of disappears. They have what's called a single purpose LLC. We'll talk about LLCs and corporations in a later uh, lecture. But all of a sudden this developer, this entity that developed this condo building, a series of townhomes or whatever it is, that entity is an LLC that is a shell company that has zero dollars in it. So now your series of unit owners, these five or six condos that have all this water flowing in it, if they sue this developer because that's who they bought the, con bought the condo from, that's the only people they have a contract with, there's nothing there. And ultimately, it's not the developer's fault. And so there has to be a claim potentially. What would that claim be? Well, the only way that claim could be is could be in tort because you don't have a contract with them. So that's where this overlap comes. Now, you're not an injured person where there's a duty owed to society and your negligence created this injury. What happens, though, in Illinois, not in every state, but many states in Illinois, there's this thing called the economic loss rule. It's this really weird thing, and it's actually kind of frustrating to, because I've had to deal with this where I've represented architects, I've represented also condo owners, and I've been on both sides of this argument. And I'm just going to explain it to you because it's going to come up in your careers. Um, we will not be tested on the economic loss rule. I just want to explain this because where this overlap is. So I'm a, I'm a homeowner. I've got these warped floors. They're all ruined. I've got to spend thousands of dollars to have them ripped up and put in. And somebody should pay me for that. If I sue the developer, there's not much money there. I mean, that's who my claim is against, but I'll bring that claim and see what I can do. The real estate, there's some real estate laws that where the, after the deed has been cut, the contract severed, and some other stuff. We won't worry about that. But, but So I bring this claim against the developer. In Illinois, the economic... And you would think I could bring a tort claim against the architect because the architect clearly has breached its standard of care. And as we've said, if you're injured by, by physical, personal injury, the standard of care applies to general society at large. Society. I have to be a good architect. I can't be negligent because people will be getting injured. But it doesn't necessarily, because of this thing called the economic loss rule in Illinois, apply to physical injuries that are not like to the structure as opposed to the um, individual. In this case, the condo association had a two-part tort claim. One was the parapet wall was improperly designed and needed to be fixed and remedied. And that's where the defect occurred. Then each individual unit owner said, I have all this damage to the interior of my condo. Well, I as the architect have an obligation to design the parapet wall correctly. After Mother Nature then brought the water in and started leaking into the condo association, that's not my problem necessarily. According to the economic law rule, what ended up happening in this is, I say, your negligence claim, condo association, is not valid to the individual unit owners. You're out of luck. And the law in Illinois supports you on it. And the only way you can recover from the losses that you incurred onto your floors and all the costs there is through the developer, not me. I may have to pay for the repairs to the parapet wall, but other consequences, so like a consequential damage to that, I don't have to go after it. I, can't, I don't have to pay for it as the architect. It's a strange rule. It doesn't make sense. But the reason why they do this, this economic loss rule, is because where do you draw the line? I am obligated as the architect in my standard of care to design the parapet wall correctly. The later damage that happened is a consequence, so it's not a necessarily a direct... It, it, some people could argue it's a direct flow. Literally, the water flowed down the water and went into these units. 
But where do you draw the line? So what the, what the law comes in and says, we're going to hold them liable if at the top level, whatever they had, this is of their design, but the consequential losses that come from that are going to be barred from the economic loss rule. Now, there's some recent changes in the law where they actually have been able to try to sidestep on the developer side and try to go after the entity that has the money. We're not worried about that as much today either. But it's this strange overlap between the negligence and tort where you normally would think the architect would be responsible for all of those damages if, in fact, the architect was negligent. But, in fact, it's only limited to what they're responsible for due to this economic loss rule. I only raise it because it comes up all the time in construction. It comes up all the time later on. It, but it's, it's, a, it's a legal, um, I won't say legal fallacy, it's a legal mechanism to protect the economics of, of architecture and construction and a lot of other things. And so the esoteric parts of it, the nuances and how you argue it and where the examples come in, leave those to the lawyers. It's not necessary for you guys. If this was a, if this, if you guys were a bunch of law students, I test you on this, but it's not worth it. But I just want to point out that there are going to be times that there's a difference between your standard of care and where you're, whether you're, even if you breached it to society, whether you're going to actually be liable for paying money. Injury to a physical person, no matter what, you're always going to have to, if you were negligent, you will have to write a check. Injury to a building or damage to the structure, it's limited necessarily on what you guys did. That's the economic loss rule. Okay? All right. The purpose of tort law. Why do we have this? Promote safety. We want everybody to act reasonable. We want everybody to act to a standard of care. If we have that standard, and the standard is created by a number of things, codes and laws, it's also industry, what happens in the industry, common sense. If we have that standard, presumably that standard is based on everybody's safe. So it's to promote safety. It's also to promote predictability of behavior. If you design in accordance with the standard of care, if you act that way, at least or better, we all know that the building is not going to fall over or the parapet wall is not going to leak. And the reason why you want that predictability is because when that building leaks and there's a lawsuit, and if you try to figure out whether it was done, whether the designs were correct or not, you can have an expert come in and say, this is what we expect to see. We expect this level of competence. That's the standard of care. And as a result, if they fail to achieve that bar, they're negligent. If they've exceeded that bar, they're not negligent. And just because there was water leakage doesn't mean that they're in violation. So you have to have this predictability to create a level of standard of care. The last thing is, is so you can allocate risk or loss of injury. Was it the contractor negligent? Was it the architect negligent? Were they both negligent? Was there a balance between who was more or less? Did the electrician, when she was on the project site, was she acting in accordance with the standard of care? Did she precariously balance the ladder such that that's why she was injured? So was her tort, her injury, something that was because of somebody else's negligence or some of theirs? So we have to factor all those things in when you figure out whether the lawsuit is, is, is proper or not. One thing, I'm going to give you one quick example of this predictability and, and this concept of the level of standard of care. So I had a project, or I had a case where my, my client was the architect, and it was um, a series of uh, apartment complexes, a number of buildings. It was out in the burbs. There was probably like 20 units per building, and there was a half a dozen buildings. Um, and the, uh, the um, roof system had this, these, these big trusses that were in there. And it turned out, the trusses were, crea were, were created with a, a fire retardant. The, the, the beams were infused with this fire retardant material. And it was one of the most, at the time that they designed it, you went out to the, the, the spec sheets and you looked at all the information and it turned out, in fact, it was the highest rated. Everybody approved it and everything else. And so they designed the building, used what they believed to be these fire retardant truss systems. About 10 years later, 8 or 10 years later, I don't know what is, it was within the state. Remember we talked about the standard of the statute of limitation, the statute of repose last week, the 4 years, but the 10 years. It was within that period of time, 6, 8 years. They discovered that these trusses actually were not fire retardant. There were problems with the chemicals. There was a chemical breakdown over the period of years. And one of the buildings caught fire and it burned down. Nobody was injured, but they, had, they lost the unit. 
And the problems had, there were problems with these trusses. So they sued my architect. And they said, your client was negligent in its design because we expected these trust systems to hold up and survive, and they did not. They breached the standard of care. And their argument was very simple. The standard of care says you design something that's fire retarded. And this obviously wasn't, so you breached the standard of care. On first blush, makes sense. I owe duty to the society at large. I design something that's not going to be able to burn down. That's my job. This thing burned down. I failed to do my job. But the concept here, promote safety? Yes, you want to have it safe. Allocate the risk of loss. If there was loss, the loss was the loss of the building. Yeah, we can allocate because the architect, oh, they didn't design according to the standard here, or did they? At the time, however, and this was what's called state-of-the-art. We used what's called a state-of-the-art defense. At the time that the trusses were specified, they were considered state-of-the-art. They were in the cut sheets. The industry accepted those beams as fire retardant. You cannot require the architect or the contractor or other people to see into the future. And if they go in and they're designing a building, they open up. At this time, it was before people used everything on the Internet. They were opening up these books. They were flipping through these things. They found these trusses that worked and everything else. They said, these are new trusses. These are what is required. This is what the standard of care created at the time it would have been predictable that these would have held up from the knowledge that the architect had. It was the state of the art. Six years later, by that time, they didn't know that the chemicals were going to break down and they actually weren't going to work. And so the lawsuit, we won. We won and we got out on what's called a state of the art defense. Because while when the injury occurred, the loss occurred, had we designed it at that year, we would have been in violation of our standard of care because we would have specified something that would have burned out. But six years or eight years before when we designed it, it was sufficient. So the standard of care, interestingly enough, is this moving target. And you have to look at it, and that's where, I think I have it on the slide coming up, but I talked about it in the other thing. It's what a reasonable architect would do working in a similar situation for a similar project at a similar time. You have to think, I'm designing a house in, in Illinois in 2019. It's not a house in California in 2019 where you have to think about earthquake situations. So there's different things that come into, into play as to what standard of care is being applied. So it's this, again, a negligent concept, the duty you owe to society, where you're working, the time of year, the state of the art, all these things factor in, but contractually you're going to owe it, says in the contract, I'm going to work in accordance with standard care. So, just a little side on this predictability, what is predictable or not, sometimes it changes. Okay, types of torts. So, there's just, there's two types. There's intentional torts, and then there's negligence. Intentional torts can be both civil or criminal, okay? Intentional tort, battery, we all heard about battery. Battery is the striking of another person. So, if you strike somebody, they can bring a claim against you for a tort, or you could be prosecuted for that. Assault, putting another person in fear of immediate harm or contact. So you don't have to necessarily physically hurt someone in assault, you just have to put them in fear. Okay? Think of it this way, like one of the most famous cases you're ever going to know about as far as where the overlap between the criminal and the civil, O.J. Simpson. O.J. Simpson was criminally tried for the death of, of uh, Nicole Brown Simpson and Ron Goldman. And he was found not guilty. There was a civil lawsuit for that, because murder is battery. There was a civil lawsuit. The standard in the criminal case is by beyond a reasonable doubt. The standard in a civil case for intentional tort, it could be either the preponderance or it could be just um, that it's more than less. It's 50% or more. So that's an instance where there's a battery, there's a criminal case, and there's a battery, which is a, a civil case, a tort case. That happens a lot, where someone, and it doesn't matter whether they're convicted or not convicted on the criminal side, you have a right of someone who is injured to bring a claim against the party that injured you, both civilly. You can ask the, the, the state to prosecute, whether they do or don't. You still have a claim in battery or assault on that physical injury in civil. Okay? Trespass. 
Everybody knows what trespass is. It's the invasion of someone else's real property. It's going on to their real property. Trespass isn't like taking something. It's that their physical, their, their um, material property. It's going on to their real property, real estate. That's trespass. And if you're not, and if it's the invasion, and you don't have you don't have authority, you haven't been given authorization. There's no ratification. So that's another intentional tort because your trespass may have injured someone. However, that is depending on what they do, you can bring a claim against that. Conversion, stealing. That is another claim. Another conversion is something that also can be criminal and civil. Someone steals something from you, the state can prosecute. If you suffer a loss because they've stolen from you, you also have a civil claim against that. Because obviously, if somebody's going to be, you know, whether they're stealing corporate secrets, whether they're stealing from the, from the IRS, whether they're stealing on, on trading, who knows what they're stealing, obviously there's going to be a criminal action, but the state is not there to get your money that you lost, so you can bring a civil claim for conversion. Others, false imprisonment, that's kind of would be, this would be, um, kidnapping would be the criminal side of it, false imprisonment would be the, tort, the, the civil side of it, an intentional infliction of emotional distress, uh, that sometimes also is, is coupled with an assault. So if you are abusive to someone, but you don't necessarily physical do it, it's intentional infliction of emotional stress, intentional here as opposed to negligent, and then defamation and libel. When you actually say something about someone, whether you defame them or whether it's libel, and that's depending on whether it's print and who they are as a person in society. But these are all considered intentional torts. You intentionally create something where you injure someone. It's not because you acted negligently. In fact, you intentionally did that. All of them are both I cannot both be brought criminally and civilly. Okay? Negligence. So negligence towards, and this is the thing that comes most of the time into uh, our factor of play. You know, actually, there's one other one on the screen. Um, another intentional towards is fraud. And I, I, as I think I told you guys, I had a lawsuit in the last couple of years where my client was um, accused of committing fraud. And that was something and that they tried to say we intentionally defrauded them. We were able to defeat that because we didn't. Um, but that's another intentional tort. Okay, negligence. What is it? It's a causing of a loss or injury by failing to act in accordance with the applicable level of care and caution. Standard of care. If you fail to act to whatever that level is, you're negligent. There are different standards applied to different people in different professions. As I said, you're an architect in California and you're designing in Southern California, you have to deal with earthquakes or maybe Northern California where the earthquake fault lines are. You have a different set of rules that's going to apply to you when you're designing here in the Midwest. Just different things. Midwest, you've got to worry about snow loads. You have to worry about snow loads when you're designing something in Hawaii. So there's different standards to different people, different professions. You're an architect. You don't have to be able to act as if you come up to somebody on the street who looks injured and you help them out you're not going to be considered acting in a standard of care of a physician. So different professions have different standards. So you have to know that it's this moving target of what your standard of care is. Society-driven in many respects. Obviously what society wants to stay safe, what they expect from you as an architect, an accountant, an attorney, a contract worker, a business person, that's what creates this standard of care. That's why it's this moving target. Everything changes. What was acceptable now wasn't acceptable in the past. Think about it in the sense of safety. You guys have probably all seen these pictures from construction projects in New York in the 20s, these black and white photos of these guys hundreds of feet in the air, sitting on girders, having their coffee, drinking and eating a sandwich, and they're just sitting on this beam, like hanging out over nowhere. And not one of them has a fall protection. They don't have any ropes or anything else. And these guys are out there, and I don't know if you've ever seen any movies of them where they're throwing rivets, where they literally get these hot rivets. They have this smelter up there that's keeping the things hot, and there's a guy that's a catcher. And he's got this metal pin, and they take it, and they pick up these rivets, and they throw them in the air, and he catches it, and then he gives it to the guy, because it's got to be hot when they put it in to rivet these beams. And this is when there's winds up there and everything else. That was the standard of care back then. Who cared about fall protection? And what's amazing is there weren't that many people that died. Like, if you take a look at the Brooklyn Bridge, I think there was like eight people that died in the construction of the Brooklyn Bridge. Now, only eight people that would never fly now because the standard of care says if you are over anything over, I don't know if it's four or six feet, you must be wearing fall protection. You have to be strapped in. They have these man lifts, all these things that happen now that wasn't there. So society drives and changes it over the time. 
There's a tribe of Indians in, Cal- in Canada that actually start when they're very little on walking on beams about two feet off the ground. They are some of the best high-rise workers in the world because this tribe of Indian, I can't remember the name of them, they're trained to walk. And by the time these kids are like five and six years old, they are walking on beams 15 and 20 feet high because that's just what they do. That's their profession. And they train these kids to do this. And then they go out. And yeah, they're still wearing ball protection nowadays and everything else. But these guys were the beam walkers. They were amazing because they could walk on these beams and their balance was incredible. But the standard of care designates as to how they're going to be working. Same thing happens to design. You know, how you designed a building and then it, what factors into it as far as cost. You know, before you had to use a 4x4, four four, now does the 2x6 work? All those things factor in for time and money and what society drives for that. Case law also has helped establish a standard of care. As the courts come in and they see something that happens, they weigh in and they say, we have looked to determine whether the architect acted reasonably in accordance with the standard of care. We heard testimony from an expert. Expert A said one thing, expert B said another thing. We as the court found the testimony of expert B the most credible and the most reasonable. And as a result, we say the architect added, acted in accordance with the standard of care. That case becomes something that when the next accident happens, and it's similar to the first case, the people that are defending the architect are going to rely on that law. Say, hey, that architect wasn't in violation of standard of care. That's the law of land. And as it progresses, the case law helps to determine what the standard of care is. So that's another thing. Society does it. And the courts and how the courts actually end up adjudicating things. Finally, often the question of whether there is negligent is left to the trier of fact, which could be the judge or jury. We talked a little bit about that last week. Trier of fact is somebody that hears the information, hears the facts of the case, and balances and weighs to see which is the most credible and which they believe. With our jury system, they come together, they sit in a jury room, they hash it out, and they figure out. And they try to have to come to an agreement, a unanimous decision as to whether we believe this testimony and this establishes what the standard of care might be. That's what the trier of fact is. And as I said, it's different like we talked about last week, what the trier of law is. The trier of law says, if you hear, Mr. and Mrs. Jury, if you hear these series of facts, you must apply this law in this direction. It's the, the trier of law kind of gives the road map so then the jury can hear the facts and balance how those facts fit into the law. So, trier fact can also affect what is considered if you're negligent or not and ultimately standard care. Any questions on that? Okay. All right. So now we're going to go in and we're going to talk about elements. So last week, and this is actually very similar to contract, when you have a lawsuit, you have to, or if you want to recover, let's just put it that way, if you want to recover from a loss, when you go to court or to arbitration or mediation, you have to establish the elements of the injury. Contract is the duty, the breach of duty, and the loss, and, there, and so you have to establish that. Here we have a contract, shows what our obligations of duty is. They breached the duty, they failed to do what was in the contract. I suffered a loss, is that the because the value of the loss? Now, surprisingly, Pretty same in, in torts. The duty, but in this case we don't have a contract, it's what you owe. So the duty is the existence of a state of care or a duty of care owed to others. Not somebody you're in contract with, but society at large. There's a certain standard that's owed to the construction workers who are on the project site, and then once the building's owed, built, there's something you owe to the people that are the tenants or the owners of the building, and then maybe visitors of that. A leaky building, you violated potentially standard of care. How the ice, the water and ice comes off the roof, maybe you violated the standard of care. All these things factor in. For the leaky building, it's the people that own the building. For the way the ice comes off, maybe it hits a, work, a, a, a passerby, just a common passerby. That's your duty. It's the standard of care, duty of care owed to others. Breach. Well, you failed to comply with that duty. Bad design, you breached your duty to the society. Or have you? Like I said in my example with the state of the art. Some they didn't breach the duty. But the claim is going to be, and this is what you have to establish in your elements, they had a duty, they breached that duty. Causation. My injury was caused by that breach of duty. You have to show a causal, a causal link between that breach and the specific consequences here, the injury. 
also sometimes referred to as proximate cause. Causation, proximate cause. The duty, breach of duty, proximate cause, and damages. I suffered an injury, most of the time monetary damages, from the consequences of that breach. So, I'm on the project site. The way the truss system and the roof system needed to be built wasn't safe. I fell through a hole. I got injured, broke my leg. Well, there was a duty. Somebody owed a duty to make sure that the system, where it was the way it was going to be designed and built, there was a breach of the duty, so we failed to do that. Causation, proximate cause, my injury was proximately caused by the way this structure was designed and built, and I fell through, and I suffered injuries. That's your loss. Now, the question is, is like, for the architect, where did they fit into that? What duty did they owe? Navy Pier. So I represent, I represent Navy Pier. I've also represented um, architects and engineers. I had an architect that we represented in VOA. You guys know who VOA is? So they're a big architecture firm that, that did a lot of the work on Navy Pier. And uh, there was a construction worker that, as I said, was my example here, fell through a hole in the roof when they were doing the, um, the big uh, kind of wide open space where they do like the Winter Wonderland and everything else. This is going back many years, not the recent renovation. Um, and he brought a claim of the injury. It was a new trust system. It wasn't the trust system that was originally designed. It was a, as a value engineering thing. All the stuff factored in. But he fell through a hole in the roof and there, was not board, there were not barriers around this hole. So he was just walking along. He didn't see it. I don't know if he was carrying something. It slipped and fell through. Pretty badly injured. The architect had been on the site. The architect was walking around. The architect actually saw the hole in the roof with the lack of the, of the barriers around it and noted it in one of his notes. So the architect in that instance made a note about safety. And as a result, my client was going to suffer liability because they stepped into the role of observing and notifying and talking about safety. Now we'll get into it a little bit later. We get into the B101 and everything else. This is always kind of the, the moral, I think a very moral and ethical um, conundrum that architects find themselves in. Once the construction starts, how the project is being built, the architect has no responsibility, zero responsibility for safety. If their design was safe, that's their responsibility. But how the contractor builds their design and whether the contractor's actions are safe or not, the architect has zero responsibility. So if the architect on this project for Navy Pier where the guy got injured, if he had walked by, saw the hole, and had written down nothing, and then later the guy fell through, there would be no liability to the architect because the contract says he had no responsibility for safety. And we all learned two weeks ago, you can change your contract and your obligations. You can make a writing later on. And as soon as this architect wrote a note and said there was no fall protection here, there was no barriers, that architect has stepped over the line and has assumed in what's called an extra contractual obligation. And so they were found liable for safety. Now, the balance, the percentage was much lower because the contractor really carries it all. So there's this ethical and moral obligation I always talk to the class every year about this, is what do you do when you see an unsafe site? I had another project where there was um, an elevator shaft and there was nothing in front of the elevator shaft and a worker fell in and died. Um, interestingly enough, this is going way back, there was a television show on Thursday night when, when Thursday night was must-see TV, when it was Friends and, and Seinfeld and all this other stuff, even before that, when everybody watched NBC, there was a show called L.A. Law. And as I was in the middle of this lawsuit, they had this, the, the, there was a woman in the, um, she was on for one season. They kind of brought her in to be the head of the firm, um, the character, and, and nobody liked her, both on the show and none of the audience liked her. The ratings were terrible because of her. So they killed her off. And I'm in the middle of this lawsuit where, because lawsuits go a lot longer, but in the middle of this lawsuit where this electrician had stepped into an elevator and my client was being sued because there was one piece of paper where it said, saw there was no fall protection, whatever it was, and it kept us in the lawsuit. We would have gotten out. 
because we said no responsibility, but they found this one teeny tiny note out of thousands of pages of documents. And we're watching, one night I'm watching L.A. Law, and sure enough, she stepped through an elevator that didn't have a little, the little yellow tape, and they killed her off, and that's how they got her off the show. And I'm like, that's what happened to my lawsuit. Like, the exact same thing. I'm like, this is real life. So my guy died, she died. Um, in any event, so as a result, there was a duty that my clients, both in Navy Pier and in this, um, this, this building here in Chicago, uh, assumed that then caused this creation of, of breach and, and approximate cause of damages so that they were injured for it. So, um, but it's, it's this, what do you do when you don't have any responsibility and you see something unsafe? You have to struggle. Go ahead, question. If you make the note, and this is, this is, your question is perfect for the solution that I, I, I reluctantly give, but I have to. Um, if you write it down, somebody will find it, and you're in the lawsuit. If you don't write it down, and you go talk to the project superintendent, and you come up and you're like, hey, Bill, you need some yellow tape around that hole, or you need to close off that elevator, you have now... What I like to say is you have uh, taken care of your moral and ethical obligation, but you have not, le well, legally you've actually violated, you're not violated, you've created an extra contractual duty, but nobody can find it. So let's say we get into this lawsuit, okay, and you get sued, and they say, you should have found this, you should have seen it, and they look through your papers and documents and documents and documents and everything, and never once they see that you noted there's a little, you're missing the yellow tape in front of the elevator shaft. Then they get Bill on the stand. Mr. Bill, what'd you do? What happened? Well, we had this. How'd you find out about it? Because Bill's already told his lawyer, the architect that told me. Bill, what'd you do? Well, how did you find out? Well, the architect told me. And the, 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 the contractor's attorney's like, ah, I can get them into the lawsuit. I can get them in because Bill said the architect told me. And then I get up and I say, Bill, regardless of the architect told me, did you ever put anything there? Then he looks stupid because he didn't put the yellow tape up. If somebody fell or died. Like, because it's to implicate that the architect told him the contractor saying, I knew about it and did nothing. So, if you tell them of an unsafe condition and you don't write it down, hopefully they take care of it before somebody's injured and nothing ever happens. But if they fail to take care of it after you told them, most of the time they're not going to say, I knew it and didn't do anything. So, they're not going to rat you out. It's a terrible way to get around it, but the reality is, is you guys are also in business, so you have to balance between what my contractual obligations are, what I owe to my company, how do I keep us from being in this multi-million dollar lawsuit, yet how do I keep people safe? So my solution, not perfect, talk to them, don't write it down. If you write it down, you're in, and then you pay any more legal fees. If you don't write it down, you may be in for a while, but I can write a brief that gets you out. And then you don't have to write the check, your premiums don't go up, you don't get yelled at by your boss, and hopefully nobody got injured. So that's my little moral dilemma speech here on, on torts and injuries. So, okay, let's continue on. Duty. Let's talk about what the duty. Get a little more deeper into it. Each element. Standard of care generally. Legal duty to act as an ordinary, prudent, and reasonable person would act. It's applicable to everybody. Reasonable. What you're going to do? But different standards for different people in different professions. Talk a little bit about that. So the balance of what that duty is. People with medical, mental, sorry, mental or physical handicaps are still required in accordance to act, act in accordance with the standard of care, which a reasonable person who is not handicapped to observe. So this is one area of the law where it's like you, if you're handicapped or, you're, or you don't have the mental facilities, you still are obligated to perform in accordance with the standard of care of a normal person. Why is that? If you're a handicapped person, why should you not have to be a course in standard care of other handicapped people? Well, you of course need to do that. But remember, one of the duty, one of the uh, parts about negligence and the standard care is predictability. Now, maybe if they see you in a wheelchair, they may be able to know that. But if you're just someone who has, is, is mentally deficient and you're walking on the street, the person walking down to you may not know that. So if you have, a, 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 if you're someone that has maybe. Um, multiple personalities, or if you have some other mental facilities where all of a sudden you're going to act out, maybe you're bipolar, there's who knows what happens. The individual who's going to be, in, who will be injured won't know that about you because they don't know you. 
So you have to be judged in accordance for predictability and safety of society that you're acting of whom a non-handicapped person or an individual that doesn't have a mental loss. So that's one kind of unique area where you're not in your same set. But the architect in California has to design like the architect in California, not like the architect in Florida. Michigan, Illinois, whatever it is. So that's one area. It's to allow, like I said, so the society can rely on people adhering to a certain minimal level standard of care. That's why there's one little space here. Now what will happen is if there has been an injury caused by someone who has a loss of mental facilities, that evidence will go into the jury and the jury is allowed themselves to balance that because we have an imperfect system and the judge will instruct them because the law says they have to act in accordance with a normal person, the non-handicapped person. The judge will instruct them that and then when you get in the jury they talk about it and they may deviate from that and that's okay because that's the way our system works. But it's this one nuanced area. Standard care also for duty. People with a greater than average levels of ability or skill are held to a higher standard. So it doesn't go lower. There is a minimum threshold. But if you have greater than average levels, you are held to a higher standard of care than that, than that possessed by a reasonable person with that liberal ability or skill. And the reason why is because if you know you're highly specialized, you should be able to act in accordance with that. Your general practitioner, when you go to the doctor, is not going to be a cardiologist. And so if the general practitioner says to you, I think that you're okay and your heart's fine, they may not have breached the standard of care of a GP. But if you went to a cardiac surgeon and they failed to give you that diagnosis, you expected that individual with a higher skill and knowledge. And so if they gave you the same diagnosis as the GP, both diagnoses were wrong. The GP would not be considered liable potentially, but the specialist heart surgeon would be because you expect them to, average, to work above the average level, to give you the opinions of that. And that's why the architect is going to be held to a standard of care different than the average person that's just doing drawings in their backyard. So I want you to get licensed. You, that's why they have the licensing process, is to make sure that you have shown your competence on that level. And Getting a license puts you in that higher level. And so the standard care rises when you work at a law architecture firm. You're an associate for a while, or you're, you're, you're a draftsman. You're working there and you're not licensed. Until you're licensed, the standard of care of what's applied to you is going to be different. Now, most of the time it's going to be applied to the whole firm, but it's going to be a different level. And when you get to that license, people are going to expect you to act more. But sometimes you think, well, gosh, then that's just a license for sued, for being sued. Sure. But the license also gets you the ability to run your own shop, to, put you to, to, to do better work, to get more jobs. A licensed architect is going to be able to bring in more than a non-licensed architect. We'll talk about licensing and everything else next week as far as how you sit in the, um, uh, whether you can be licensed as a state and everything else. But there's a benefit. So what society says is if you have now, if you are now holding your shingle out as being a highly skilled licensed individual and you are going to be compensated at a higher level, then you should carry more risk or more obligations to conform to the standard of care. To make sure that you're not breaching that duty. Does that make sense? Okay. Situations in which negligence is automatically found. Sometimes... They don't even look into the duty, or into the, the negligence. They just say, it's automatically, you've already breached that negligence there. Violation of law or valid regulation is considered to be automatically negligent. I'm driving my car. There's a stop sign. I missed the stop sign and I hit someone, whether it's another car or an individual. Clearly, my driving is negligent. But we don't even need to challenge whether I'm acting in accordance with everybody else because I have broken the law. That is automatic negligence. Automatically. We don't even have to test whether you breach the standard of care or anything else. A violation of the law in a tort claim is automatically negligence. So we could go back to this concept we were talking about battery. Someone has been injured in a battery. Someone has been beaten up. There's a criminal claim. The state prosecutes that individual who, who hurt the other one. 
the person who's battered, for whatever reason, the evidence wasn't sufficient, who knows, is found not guilty. The civil claim, you have to prove that that battery occurred and there was a breach of that. You have to prove that because the criminal didn't establish it. No, because it wasn't beyond a reasonable doubt all the other elements that come into a criminal case versus a civil. So you're creating, you're trying to go for negligence in that case. If the flip side happens and the individual is found criminally in violation of the law and battered someone, your civil case already has satisfied that first element. The duty to comply has been breached because they look, here's a finding of the law, a violation of a criminal law. So we've already established that they are negligent, automatically found. So that's what's important here. Negligent act of an agent. Here's another one where it's automatically found. It's automatically tied to the principal. Now, we haven't done agency yet. We're going to talk about it a little later. But so um, next week we'll talk about it. I think it's next week. Um, when you work for a company, the company's entered into the contract with the owner to design the building. You are acting as your company's agent. So your actions are imputed to the company. So if you acted negligently in the course of your duties, your, your actions, then the company automatically is negligent. So, you're an architect. You're on your way to a project site. The company, your, your architecture firm, M Architects, has entered into a contract with an owner. You're driving to the project site. You get in a car accident. The company is sued by the individual. It has nothing to do with the project. It's three miles away. The individual that's injured sues you individually and the company because you ran that stop sign. The company may be found liable if it's determined that your actions was in the course of your business duties. If you were driving straight from your office to the project site for a meeting and you were speeding because you were late for the meeting, the company will be brought into the case because you are an agent to the company and you were in the course of your business duties going to a meeting for the company and that's why the person was injured. So you as the driver will be liable and the company will be found liable. If, however, you were on your way to the meeting and you decided to take a deviation you decided you wanted to go over and stop off a target and pick up some sheets or something else, and you took a deviation from your route because you had an extra 45 minutes, and the car accident happened on the way to target. The company may be sued, but they will put up a defense that says, the individual who caused the injury, while they are an agent of our company, was not in the course of acting in the business. That separation and the injury was not because they were failing to act. Sure, they were negligent. Sure, they, they ran the stop sign. Sure, they hit them. We're not saying that didn't happen. And sure, they worked for us. And yes, they left our office. And yes, they were going to a meeting that was going to happen later on. But when they did this deviation, we lost that proximate cause, that causation chain. There was a separate act that created the consequence of the damage. So you as the individual who was driving the car may still be liable, but the company, because it wasn't a straight shot in this example, will not. Does that make sense? So, it can be automatically tied, but there may be some deviations. So, if an agent, if, so right here in the bullet there, if an agent acts negligently toward the third party in the scope of its authority, driving to the project site, the negligence is automatically attributed to the principal, in this case, the company. It's agency and apparent authority in either instance. Don't worry about that. We'll talk about what apparent authority is next week. But apparent authority, the concept is, is the person believed you to be an agent as opposed to you actually were designated an agent. We'll get into that a little bit more next week on what that means. Partially because I flipped these lectures, that's why that slide's still in there. So, okay. The reasonableness of a person's actions is a matter of proof, usually determined by a jury. So whether you acted negligently, you got put in facts. They did this, they did this, they did this, they did this. That means they're negligent. Case of my design and my trust system. The trust is burned, they weren't supposed to burn. Building had damage. They were obviously negligent. Those are the facts that came in. Conflicting facts. State of the art. Nobody knew. So those are the facts that come in to determine whether you have breached. A judge or jury, the trier of fact, determines how the ordinary reasonable person, 
should behave if the defendant lived up to that standard. Ordinary and reasonable in that area, did they live up to that? Trier fact figures that out. Jurors may not be aware of the appropriate standard of care. They may not know that. I mean, if you think about it, do you guys know what the standard of care is of a thoracic surgeon? Probably not. I don't know it. Maybe some of you guys have a parent or a relative that's a thoracic surgeon. But most people that's going to sit in a jury don't know that. Or what an architect's supposed to do. Or an engineer. So while they can assimilate all these facts, how do they figure out? Well, they need to be educated on what's the applicable standard of care. That's when experts come in. Both sides put up the expert. One guy says one thing, one woman says the other thing. They say something completely opposite. My client never did anything wrong. My client did everything, their client did everything wrong. However it comes in. But you have to educate the jury as to what that standard of care is. And it's the attorney's job, when you're in that trial, or if you're in arbitration or whatever, to even though we know that the experts are going to have conflicting opinions, because they're hired to support their specific client's opinions, it's the attorney's job to figure out where the commonality occurs and to get the expert to a point where they have to admit that something was right or wrong that helps the, the other side's case. So there's this balance effect. And then so the attorney is also helping to educate the witnesses. Standard of care is often established using proof from expert witnesses, subject matter, testify how the defendant was supposed to operate, civil engineer, accountant, farm professor, otherwise not support. I'll give you an example of a case I had. This was actually my, probably the most fun, or there was two, two times, but like for me, the, probably the best day that I had in taking down an expert in court. So we represented a client, um, this was out in, in Will County, and it, was, it went all the way to trial. Most cases settled long before trial, or tri even up at the courthouse steps or anything. We went to trial this. So we represented a company that made, that made what's called roll form, roll, cold roll form steel. They, they basically for rector set systems. And they designed this building, um, and then you send it, and, it, and the whole building is already designed and everything else, and then the contractor is supposed to bolt it together. And, and it's pretty, it's like a tinker toy system or an erector set system, how this building is going to go. And there were problems with loads and how the building supported certain elements. And so there was... There was parts of the beams that sagged, and, and, and the question came down to it, was it the design, was it the, um, was it the, uh, um, the construction, what was it? So I had this guy in the stand, and we had issues where the sagging came in, the pitch of the roof, and everything else. And this, this expert, who was hired by the OSI, um, had testified in a case about a similar situation. And I found it because I was doing research and I reached, I, I was in what's called uh, LexisNexis, which is like the, before Google, it was like the legal Google. And we found, I found testimony from this guy. Actually, it was myself and another co-defendant. We found this lawsuit that he was in and we found his, in the actual lawsuit, they had quoted his testimony. Rarely do they, of course, quote actual testimony. They, they summarize it. But it was actually question by question. There was about 15 questions in a row on what happened to be how the pitch and how the design of this was supposed to be. And it was 100% supporting our argument of whether the pitch was proper, whether there was the construction was issued, and everything else. Yet the other side hired him. We had this case before his deposition. So we went into his deposition. We didn't know if the case was going to settle. We didn't know if it was going to go to trial. This was months before the case. And we went into his deposition and we had this ammunition. There was a little debate between my co-defendant and mine, one of the other attorneys, and, and he said, let's not ask him any questions on this case. Let's hold it. And I just wanted to stick it right in front of him because I wanted to get him. I, wanted, I had it because we had him. Like, let's ask him these questions because we have his written report and he said A, B, and C, and we have his testimony and we said A, B, and C is wrong. So let's put it right in front of him. Let's challenge him. And he's like, no, let's wait. Let's wait. So he, I let him wait. I, I listened to him and it was the best advice I got in this case. So we got him in the deposition, we asked him questions, and we almost like almost the exact series of questions that we asked him in this. And of course he sided because he's an expert, he's paid for it, he sided with his client as to what the standard was and whether it was a breach and everything else, and we got him on record in his testimony. And the case didn't settle. And we go to trial. We get him up on the stand. And because I have an architecture background and everything else, they let me do his cross because I'm the best in conversing with, with technical guys. 
um, even though my co-defendant was the one that said, we've got to hold this, don't do it. And he really wanted to do it. He's like, can't let you do it. So I got him up on the stand, and I went through those questions. I go, do you remember giving this deposition? Yes. Do you remember being asked this question? Yes. Do you remember giving this answer? Yes. And we went through, boom, 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 boom. And then I'm like, do you remember such and such a case you were involved in five years ago? And he's like, I'm not sure. I'm like, well, let me give you a little bit more facts. And so I refreshed his memory on it. He's like, oh, yeah, I do remember that case. And I go, do you remember that this case had to do with this type of structure? He's like, well, it was very different. I'm like, well, let me see if I can refresh you a little bit more. And I asked him a couple of the questions. I go, do you remember in this lawsuit being asked this question and giving this answer? And there was like two or three questions. And he's like, and I'm like, so is this the same issue that we're dealing with here? He's like, well, you know, and he tried to swim out of it, but he couldn't. And then I just walked through the, the 10 or 12 questions that I had him on that we got him locked in in his deposition that I had him repeat in trial, and then I went through the questions in this lawsuit that he had made this separate and complete opposite opinion four or five years before. And I didn't ask him to conclude anything. I didn't need to. I just said, do you remember being yes this question and given this answer? And I would read the question, I would read the answer, and I'd say, do you remember that? And he'd be like, yes. And then I go, do you remember being asked this question and given this answer? And I said, yes. He said, yes. And we got them all in. And then the plaintiff rested their case. And then you do what's called a motion for JNOV. You actually go to the judge and you say, they're so full of crap that this case can't go any further. And we presented that to the judge and we pointed out that here was this expert that said what he said. And it was completely opposite. And we won the case from there. We didn't have to put on our case because of that. And that was when I helped educate the court. There was no jury there. I helped educate the court that the standard of care that they were trying to espouse unto my client was wrong. And in fact, their own expert three or four years before, five or six years before, had said it was wrong. I don't really care at this point whether which one was right or wrong. And the point is, is that's part of the system, but I was trying to say, whatever that standard here is that they said my client violated, the guy that they paid to put up in the stand didn't agree with it. But in fact, he did. And when we got him, we got the testimony show, the court said he's so incredible, they don't have enough jury, they don't have, they don't have enough evidence to present to me what the standard of is because I have to disregard everything he said. So you can't be in violation of that. So that was fun. That was a really fun day for me. Okay. So a little bit more of this. Sometimes the plaintiffs can avoid providing what defendants were negligent just as the, do the doctrine of called it ret ipsa loquitur. My son would be really happy he's taking Latin. The phone comes from Latin. Um, and uh, it's basically... The situation where you have exclusive control, and if there's a failure, regardless, you are going to be, it is what it is, you are going to be found in violation of that. But the plaintiff must show that something happened which ordinarily does not happen unless the defendant was negligent. So, in this case, this is where I say the sprinkler example is, is if you design a sprinkler system and it fails to, occur, to, to perform, but you're not sure where that system failed, but you are the sole and independent person. We, by the way, just as a, while I'm giving this example, so when, you, when, when, when an architect designs a building, there are certain things that the architect won't do. They're going to send to a specialist. Sprinkler systems are one. Curtain walls are another one. So you design a building, you're going to go and you're going to look at the code, you're going to say, well, we need to have this and that. Maybe it's going to be a dry system, maybe it's a wet system or anything else. But you're not designing the system. You send it to the sprinkler company. They're the ones that have a proprietary system. They design it, they manufacture it, they install it. They're the only people to do it. You just say, we need to make sure we comply with these codes. Here's sprinkler company to do it. If the sprinkler system fails and there's an injury or loss because of the failure of the sprinkler system, this applies. You were negligent because you were the exclusive control over that. It wouldn't ordinarily not happen unless there was a negligence. We don't have to prove that they were negligent. We have to say, the sprinkler system did not act properly. So, res ipsa locator falls in. So, that's just this one area where, again, it's kind of like, um, it, it will be, it, you don't have to prove it. It's going to happen. You know that it's negligence. So, any questions on that? Now, the professional standard of care, this is what applies to you guys. This is where we come in and, and figure it out. Professional is a person whose occupation requires sufficient skill and judgment that it would not be fair to require him to guarantee, but, but it would not be fair to require him to guarantee results. 
doctors, lawyers, architects, you guys never guarantee something. You are skilled, you are professional, you are going to act to a standard, but you never guarantee. You're never going to have a doctor before you go into surgery. Say, I guarantee you, you're going to come out just exactly perfect. They're never going to do that. And neither you as an architect are ever going to guarantee your building. You are going to perform in accordance with the standard of care. A reasonable professional architect acting in a similar situation for a similar project at a similar time. And the reason why you can do that is because you will never design a perfect building. There will never be a perfect surgery. They may be so great that everything works perfectly and works great later on, but you don't guarantee that. Interestingly enough, though, contractor provides a warranty, which is a guarantee, that the materials I use are going to be new, or I'm going to be working in a good and workmanlike manner. So there's different elements, and this gets into, because we're going to go into insurance a little bit later, if you are ever in a contract and you're signing a contract and the owner says in the language of the contract that you guarantee or warranty your services, cross out those words. Guarantee and warranty in an architect's contract is bad because you cannot and will not. And in fact, if you sign a contract that says, I, architect, guarantee my services or warranty my services, not only are you not going to be able to live up to that 100% standard, but your insurance company is going to say, I don't have to insure you. Because the insurance company only insures you to perform in accordance with the standard of care. So it's bad for you because you can't be perfect, and it's bad for you for business. So the words guarantee and warranty are black hats. Stay away from them. They're bad. Contractors? i got to use that language all the time. In fact, in a contractor's contract, there's a whole section called warranty. You go through everything of what they, that they have to warrant. So, but lots of professionals aren't always perfect 100%. And this is what I've been saying all the time. The professional standard here is the level of skill and care which an ordinary person of the profession, ordinary person of the profession, not the superstar architect, not the rock star thoracic surgeon, just the average ordinary super architect, the average ordinary thoracic surgeon, would observe under special, similar circumstances at the same time and location. You're going to be held to the standard of, your, of the same type of people as you in the same area at the same time. Continue on standard of care. Typically, expert witnesses from the same profession are required to prove the applicable standard of care. So if you're going to have testimony on whether you as the design professional of accordance with the standard of care, you can't have a contractor come in and testify. You've got to have an architect or an engineer. Whatever that specific thing was. Like for my pump case. The other side brought in a guy that designed pump systems. He submitted his report. But he had never worked on the pump systems that we had designed. So he was part of their case to say we committed fraud. But he never worked on our reports. In fact, one of the questions came in was, was the pumps not working properly because there was vibration of the way the system was designed? Not, and we didn't design the system, we just designed the pumps. There was an engineer that designed the whole system. There was vibrational issues that came in. And this, this um, expert, during his deposition, said he was not a vibrational expert said he had never done anything in vibration, and said that he had never read the vibration reports. So we actually filed a motion in front of the court to say, by his own testimony, he's not a vibration expert. By his own testimony, he never read the reports. Therefore, we are asking this court, because we are on the eve of a trial, we are asking this court to bar any reference to vibrations being a part of this case for or against why the pumps failed from going in front of the jury. Because the jury's going to look at this guy as an expert. They're going to think that he's smarter than everybody else. He's there to educate. And if he's allowed to talk to vibration when he's already said, I'm not an expert, I never read the report, that would be prejudicial to my client. 
And the reason why we wanted to do that is because I had a vibration expert that said the pumps were fine. The reason why the system failed was due to vibration. Here's my investigation. Here's my report. If I was able at trial to put that in without anybody challenging me, that's strategically good for my client. They may have other arguments against me that the jury will balance, but if I have this expert unchallenged and an expert report and his investigation, I don't want anybody to come across it. The judge denied our motion. I was shocked. Um, luckily, we didn't go to trial. We settled before, but he probably would have, we would have brought a claim against him that he committed reversal error. Um, he'd never had a case like this before. His logic... Um, looking at this, this is professional, where he, where, whether he's from the same profession, was he's been an engineer for 30 years. So he should be able to talk about things like vibration. Like, but he even said he wasn't an expert. Why did you allow that in? That's sometimes what happens in the law. In this case, the judge let it in. We didn't have to go to trial. It was before. We brought the motion. But um, sometimes things go not the best way. My client was freaking out when I called him up and told him we lost that motion. Because... This guy was going to come in and say, it had nothing to do with vibration. I know it's nothing to do with vibration. Because I've been an engineer for 30 years. And that would have questioned our report. We still would have put our report in. We still might have won. But we were able to resolve it elsewhere, which was good. Um, so like I said, their, their standard of care is generally beyond the kind of the jury. The jury doesn't understand it. We don't know what a thoracic surgeon is supposed to do or not. Um, and then even a layman, though, can determine that certain professional conduct violates appropriate standards so this is here, this is where you might not need an expert because the doctor actually injected a poison into a patient's vein. So maybe there's times when you need an expert, but maybe there's not. So sometimes when the jury can actually say, well, geez, that just makes sense that they violated the standard of care, as my example, which is so shocking, but there are cases of that where there was something that they injected that's the wrong thing. That's a violation of the standard. We don't need an expert to tell me that if you put poison or some other thing, some other chemical in someone's body that's going to cause them to die, surely they've breached their standard of care. Nobody expert needs to tell me that. But I can come in. All right. That was all duty and everything else. Causation. How does that injury cause? Plaintiffs must prove the defendant's breach of the standard of care was the proximate cause of the injury. Proximate cause is both actual cause and not too distance of the causal injury, the causal chain. Plaintiff does not have to show that the defendant's conduct was the only cause of their injury, just that it was in that chain. There could be other things that factor in, but it was not necessarily the only cause. Then the plaintiff's claim is sufficient or if one of the causes results in the injury. Construction, this comes in all the time. For the example of the lack of the yellow tape in front of the elevator, was the writing down of the failure to put the yellow tape by my client the cause of the injury? No. Maybe. Because we had the safety violation, the safety issue, and this electrician stepped in because there was no barrier. If there had been a barrier that my client noticed and wrote down, that's enough in the proximate cause. It's not the only cause because we've already established that the contracts say the contractor is responsible for safety. We know the contractor failed to do its duty and therefore we know that A, for sure approximate cause, was the contractor's failure to have a safe work site. That doesn't mean that it was the only cause of the injury. It was the only one, in fact... My guy saw the lack of the yellow tape, wrote it down, and recognized. So there was a safety obligation that my client took on, unfortunately, but they did. And so there was enough of a causal connection. And then you balance in construction. Construction defects, safety problems. Design defect, noticing the safety problems and recording it. Creating an extra contractual duty. Both arguably are proximate cause of the injury. There is a has a causal link, a nexus between the failures by the contractor and the architect and the injury by the individual. Enough that there could be recovery. What ends up happening, though, is when you go back to the jury box, the jury actually does an apportionment of the faults. And so maybe if the guy, the, the injured, the person that died there, I think the claim was for about six or eight million dollars, 
maybe it turns out that we settled it before because as soon as they found this piece of paper, we're like, we've got to settle this. But um, maybe that the, the split is 100000 to the architect and 9.9 or 9.9 million dollars to the contractor. There's a balancing of what that is. But that doesn't mean that your individual, your, your client or your, the entity is not liable because there's something else. So it can be more than one. The test of whether the cause is proximate is whether the results were reasonably foreseeable. And that's why when my client noted in a piece of paper that they didn't put the yellow tape in front of the elevator or didn't put the barriers around the hole in the roof of the Navy Pier, why that keeps my client in the game. Because it's reasonably foreseeable if there's an unsafe condition that someone could be injured from that unsafe condition. And the courts interpret the requirement of reasonable facility quite broadly. It's pretty big. What is reasonably foreseeable is based on many factors that are taken into consideration. And you let the jury decide that. So you go and you argue. You say to the jury, and I get up there in my grand closing arguments, I'll say, the contract said we had no responsible for safety. The contractor already said they failed to put that up. You heard testimony from Bill. He didn't put it up. I know that he was told by my person to put the yellow tape up. Yes, you heard that testimony. And yes, you saw that one piece of paper that said we did notice it. And of course there was that discussion. But it's still the obligation of the contractor, and I will do everything I can to pile on the contractor and to minimize and even try to bring some humanity to my client. My client saw this and wrote it down and recognized it and told Bill. In fact, they were trying to protect someone. So I will try to do that. And then the jury goes back and says, well, was it reasonably foreseeable after the architect wrote this down and told Bill about it that they still should be responsible for the injury that happened because Bill failed to do that? I will try to minimize and create what's reasonably foreseeable from my client's actions from what theirs was. That's a balance that I do as a lawyer. But ultimately, this question of this proximate cause of reasonable foreseeability comes to the client or to the, the jury to determine if that's cause of the injury, the causation. Make sense? Okay. The causal chain may be broken by a superseding or innovating cause of the injury. That's that trip to Target when you're on your way to the meeting. By acting, act like someone else. Could be someone else. The defend, after the defendant's breach, which is so extraordinary or unforeseeable as to break the causal chain. So that's the one way. Criminal acts or intentional torts of third persons can break the causal chain. Unforeseeable acts of God. Those can break the causal chain. So you may have been already, you may have breached your duty, you may have been negligent, but if something happens intervening even after you've been negligent, that doesn't mean you're responsible. You could design a building that won't stand up once it's constructed and the building is struck by lightning and it collapses. Or there's winds that come and knock it down. And you can make an argument that had these acts of gods that came in that were unforeseeable because it was a hundred year storm or whatever it is, my negligence, yes, I failed to perform to the standard of care, that chain was broken by one of these actions and therefore I am not the cause of the injury. When the building was struck by lightning or blown over, that's when the beam fell on the individual. The wall fell down and killed the individual. It's not because I designed it improperly. Maybe I did, maybe I didn't. The reason why it fell down was because the wind blew it down. So that's a breach, or a, not a breach, but a break in that causal chain. And therefore, my negligence is not the proximate cause of the injury. And that all comes down to, again, the jury has to balance which one is which. Plaintiff's own negligence. The individual who is injured is a defense. Now, we have these things in Illinois and other states. This is concept of contributory negligence and comparative negligence. Um, contributory negligence is the old rule. The concept of contributory negligence is, is if you are the injured party and you contributed in any fashion to your injury, you cannot recover. That used to be the law of the land everywhere. Even if in some places you were 1% at fault and the other person was 99% at fault, if you had any contribution to your own injury, your stupidity, your failure to look around, how you were acting, whatever it might be, you cannot recover. 
the courts and society deem that really not reasonable, except for in Alabama, Maryland, North Carolina, Virginia, which still uses elements of contributory negligence and how their percentages factor in. Everything else now is what's called comparative negligence. Now you balance who all was at fault, and the jury goes back, and one of the instructions says is, take this little list, plaintiff, defendant, 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 and write in a percentage of who was at fault. What are the percentages? In comparative negligence, it's a 50% rule. So the plaintiff can be 49.999% at fault and still recover. As soon as the plaintiff becomes 50.011, they can never recover because they're more than 50% at fault. So it's this balancing test, 50% rule on this comparative. It allows the scales to actually try to be equal. In comparative or contributory up there, it could have been 1% the plaintiff's fault, no recovery. Now, they can be up to 49.99999%. So that's the difference. But this is the modern rule. It seems actually more fair. It's a little harsh when if you're 1% or 5% or 10% and the other party's so negligent that that's the only, you know. Because contributory negligence means everybody has to be perfect. Comparative is we're human. That's the difference between the two. Damages. So we had duty, breach, causation, damages. You have to have all four of those to recover on a suit. If you haven't suffered any damages, monetary or otherwise, I could be negligent. I could have breached my duty. I could have been a loss because of the proximate cause because of that. But if there's no damages to recover, what's the point of a lawsuit? If the building was, if there was problems with the construction of the project slowed down due to the fact that I designed it properly and we had to correct some of the design issues, in the meantime the contractor was delayed and everything else, but the building still opened on time and the owner didn't suffer any economic losses and there was no change in the cost of the project, I was negligent. I breached my duty. There's a proximate cause between the slowing up of the project and everything else, but if the, con if the owner of the project never suffered any losses, no lawsuit. So... Damages are that's where there's not. Damages are intended to compensate an injured party for the injured suffered, whether it's physical or loss in their building, their building, their construction, time, money, maybe lost profits. Examples of damage in a traditional tort claim: lost wages, can't go to work, you're injured; cost of repair or replacement of the damage to the property, pain and suffering. I lost my leg. There's a value to that. I can't go to work. I can't be an electrician anymore because I can't go up and down ladders because I have a leg. So I lost my wages, something to do with the calculation. I had a lawsuit where a guy um, had a leg off. He was an electrician, couldn't go up and down. The lawsuit was for about $8 million, bucks, $7, $8 million, because they calculated. The, the gentleman was like 27 years old. They calculated his union wages over the next 30 years of how much he would be making on those things and the increase and in everything else. They bring in actuaries and all this other stuff. I said, look at all my lost wages. They also had the pain and suffering. There's a value to what the pain is that they're going to have because they have to wear a prosthetic. There's a loss of consortium claim. The, the, the ability for him to run around with his kids or to enjoy spending time with his wife. So all these values that come into him, the pain and suffering side. Particularly in personal injuries, damage maybe millions of dollars. You guys have all heard the, the, the verdicts. I think um, there, there was a case uh, in, um, a huge case, I want to say it was in the 20 millions, if not mistaken. Rachel Barton, she was a, a, a violinist for the Chicago Symphony Orchestra. And the Metra train tracks, or the Metra train and the way the doors work, this was about maybe 15, 18 years ago, um, they didn't properly close. She was getting on the train and she had her, it wasn't a Stradivarius, it was another very famous type of violin, but it was worth about $300,000. And she was getting on the train and it got caught in the way the door system worked and she was reaching down to get it and her legs got run over. Um, so she lost her legs and... She lost her violin and some other stuff. She, if you ever, if you Google it, she's actually quite a, an accomplished. She, she still plays now and she, she's well renowned. Um, but she had a lawsuit, uh, and it was for I think they recovered like twenty, thirty million dollars for it for the loss of this because of all the things that went through. And, and, and in fact, when they tried the case, they actually built a mock-up and brought it into courtroom of the metro doors and how the door system worked. It was pretty amazing. So I went and watched part of that trial. So. 
Uh, design defects in major buildings can cost hundreds of thousands of millions of dollars to repair. You know, you, you have a building where there's, even like a leaky roof is going to cost hundreds of thousands of dollars to fix. So big dollars in, in tort cases you can recover. One thing you cannot recover, this is another little nuanced area that I think is important, is what's called betterment as far as damages. Betterment is a concept um, that uh, if you design something and it fails, and the owner that has the building replaces your design, they are only allowed to put in what you, to the level of what your design is. Effectively, if you design a Chevy, they can't rebuild a Cadillac and recover the value of the Cadillac. And in fact, the pump case that I keep talking about that we had, that's what the, one of our biggest defenses that we had was, is that our pumps and the entire pump station that was designed was worth about $480,000 from design to complete construction. That included all the engineering, all the materials, and all the construction, about $480,000. The lawsuit was just under $2 million because when they redesigned it, they went from a two-pump system to a four-pump system. They used different types of pipes. It was larger. And we made the argument of what's called betterment. You are now driving the Cadillac of pump stations. You contracted to get a Chevy. If we were liable, which we didn't think we were, your recovery is the value of the Chevy. The most you should ever get from us is $480,000 plus or minus some change, not the, uh, just under $2 million. That's better. You are not allowed in Illinois to get better than what you originally contracted for. Not all states go with betterment, but Illinois does. Okay. I have, um, do you guys know who Mike Brady is? Some of the Brady Bunch? You guys know who the Brady Bunch is? So, when I was young, because if you remember my little speech my first day, he was the most famous architect around. That's what his job was. So, I have a little clip from Mr. Brady on a tour. So, basically what he said was, you're a big fat liar, but the legal thing that the judge should have said was, you have suffered no damages because his claim was he had a neck injury and he couldn't move and that was a cause of him not being able to go to work, lost wages, he was putting all these monetary things on because of the pain and suffering and the injury to his neck. Granted, this has nothing to do with architecture, but our hero, Mike Brady, because he knows this guy's a big fat liar, puts the briefcase on, he turns his neck, and in fact it shows that there are no damages suffered here. And as a result, while they may have proved that Mrs. Brady did actually drive improperly, because that was where the judge was going, on the balances of the two testimonies, the judge was appointed to say, I believe, because I'm the, in this case, a, jur a judge, no jury, the judge was the trier of fact and law. The judge appeared to be, never got there, but appeared to be saying, I listened to the facts of the individual and Mrs. Brady, the man and Mrs. Brady, and I believe his testimony that he actually looked where he was driving, and I don't believe hers that she wasn't. We don't really need to worry about We don't need to care about that. We don't need to care whether Mrs. Brady or the other gentleman was negligent or not. What we know is that he, the guy there, never suffered any damages. There was no loss. And as a result, the lawsuit should be tossed. Again, obviously, this guy was trying to, to lie to the court, so that didn't help his case either. But in this case, from when I was young, my hero was able to make sure that this lawsuit doesn't go forward. Okay. One little element here on contribution, this concept called indemnity. We're going to talk about indemnity throughout the place, but I'll tell you what contribution is here. Contribution, so in lawsuits, um, lots of parties come involved. It's never just 
the injured person, or not never, but rarely it's the injured person against the party that they think did something wrong. And so what sometimes happens is the individual, I had a case where uh, there was a woman who worked at a building for DePaul. Um, it was after the project was completed. She worked in an area and she uh, allegedly had lupus. And she, her claim, she brought a lawsuit against my client, the architect who designed the renovated building. It was a renovation. I can't remember if she sued DePaul or not. I don't think she did because it would have been a, a workers' comp claim, but the lawsuit was only against my client initially. And, and her theory was, never was proven, but her theory was that the way that the light systems worked impacted or affected her lupus, and therefore she suffered injuries because of that. We had medical testimony that said that's crazy, doesn't matter. We ended up bringing in as a third party the electrician. It had to do with insurance reasons, who was going to pay the tab and everything else, because the electrician also had elements of how they installed the lights and, and what the... the, the, the um, lavaliers or whatever they're called, you know, like the, the, you guys don't have them here, but you guys have seen fluorescent lights where the, they're like a grid, a grid system and they have um, reflective material that's to diffuse the fluorescent lighting and everything else. So there was problems with that or whether they followed our design and stuff. We brought them in. We didn't have a contract with them, so I can't sue them for breach of contract. They're the electrician. We're the architect. But we were the only people sued and we knew it wasn't just, if it wasn't anybody's fault, it wasn't just ours, it was also the electrician. So we brought them in under what's called an, a theory of contribution. There's actually a statute under the law that says we can bring it. It's like a tort. It's not exactly. We said we have brought you in as a third party. The architect is suing the electrician as a third party because you contributed to the plaintiff's injury. So that's a theory of contribution. So there's this unique area in law of handling tort claims. Hers is a tort claim. We don't have a breach. We don't have a contract with the electrician, but we bring them in under this thing called contribution. Don't worry about the world of contribution and everything else for the exam. I just want you to understand that there is this, that, that multi-parties in lawsuits, you can bring people in different ways. I know we, we talk about economic loss and different things. There are ways you can bring in other parties because you want to say, you third party contributed to the plaintiff's injuries. So that's contribution. Indemnity is another theory in Illinois and every, most every state. Indemnity is the same as contribution, meaning there's a third party out there, except that the third party becomes liable to reimburse the defendant for the plaintiff's injuries. So indemnity, what I would say is, so let's say I have a contract as the electrician. So what ended up happening is the electrician then brought in the contract to the general contractor as well. And the general contractor, what they did in this instance was, in the contract between the general contractor and the electrician, there was this indemnity clause. And it says, I, electrician, will indemnify you, contractor, for all of my failures and losses. So if the contractor gets hit for damages, if the jury says, I think the contractor is liable for a million dollars, under indemnity, the contractor is going to look to the electrician and say, yeah, but it was your work. I don't do electrical work. You're the only one that does electrical work. You must indemnify. Even though the jury thought it was me and I have to write the check to the jury, you must write a check to me. So that's this concept here of indemnity. I'm not going to get into it. I have a couple bullets here. I'm going to just say out loud and then we'll walk through it. We'll talk about indemnity throughout the semester. Um, I just want you to understand that this world of indemnity sits out there. It's relevant to your work. You will be, as an architect, indemnifying owners. Because when we live in America, everybody sues. So at the end of the lawsuit, if the owner, if the jury, when they're doing the percentage apportionments, apportions 20% to the owner, the owner, because your contract with him says, I, architect, indemnify you, the owner, you're basically absorbing their 20%. You have to pick up because you're indemnifying them for your losses. That's a, and there's an insurance component and everything else in that. But it's this, it's, it, it's the full concepts of contribution and indemnity are, there are third parties involved in the lawsuits to help pay for the plaintiff's injuries. Even if you are the only one that's tagged, 
In my lupus case, if we are the architect, we're the only one that's tagged, we brought in another party under contribution. Once that party was brought in, they brought in the contractor, they had an indemnity agreement. So it's how to split and apportion the cost. Indemnity is contractual. It arises out of the contractual obligation. Um, and then I'll give my, here's my two examples. Owner sues architects for construction defects based upon the architect's negligent inspection of the contract. So there's contractors walking around, there's some defects, we don't notice it, we don't write it down. The owner, the architect brings the contractor who actually built the defective work into the trial to indemnify the architect against the plaintiff's loss. In this case, there may be language in the contract with the contractor. I, contractor, will indemnify you, architect, for my screw-ups. In this case, we didn't do good inspection, but the failure was the construction itself was improper. So we say, contractor, you must indemnify us for your failures, your construction defects. The spreading of, of the wealth of, or the, not the wealth, but who has to pick up the tab. Other example here is owner sues a contractor in construction defect, contractor sees contribution from the architect in the vagueness of plans. In that case, the, the chain goes different. Owner goes to the contractor, contractor says, not all me, there were problems with the plans. They bring in a third party to split up the losses. Does that make sense how there's this third party chain here? Indemnity ordinarily is available when liability is derivative, when the only reason that one party is negligent is the negligent act of another party from the first party responsible, the first party can attain indemnity. So, this is where this clause here goes back to our good friend um, Groucho Marx when he's reading the first party and the second party and the third party, is when you get into this, who all is part of the chain here. Indemnity is here, I'm being sued by the owner. I'm the contractor being sued by the owner. The owner says you're negligent. Well, the only reason why I am negligent is because the architect was negligent. So I bring that third party in to indemnify me to the losses I owe to the owner. Okay? That's where it comes in. Issues employer-employee, contractor-subcontractor, inspecting architect and contractor. These are areas where the second party, the employer may bring their employee in for indemnification. The contractor may name a subcontractor for indemnification. So the, the the second party in each of these chains will be picking up the tab that the first party is being charged with based on what the second party's negligence is, their failure to perform. Okay? Contractual indemnity. Any party can make a promise in a contract to indemnify another party from certain specific consequences. So you can, you can indemnify anybody you want. It's, in the, it's all contractual. Some states, like Pennsylvania, have common law indemnity, but by and large across the country, the only way you have indemnity is contractual. You say, I promise to indemnify you, meaning I will pick up the tab that you are charged with, for my failures. If I'm negligent, if I fail to perform and you're the only one that's sued by the plaintiff, the plaintiff doesn't come after me, you're allowed to come after me, and I will indemnify you for what you have to pay to the plaintiff, contractually. Subcontractors ordinarily promise to indemnify general contractor. That's typically how it goes. It's through a chain upstream if the claim results from the subcontractor's work. Contractors often promise to indemnify owners and the architects against the claims filed against the owners and architects arising out of the general contractor's work. So it's you kind of have to follow the contractual chain. Subcontractor does the bad electrical work. Contractor gets sued from the owner. Subcontractor going up the chain says, I promise to indemnify you. Contractor promises to indemnify the owner if the owner gets sued by a worker over here. The worker gets sued. The worker gets injured. Sues only the owner. Owner looks to the contractor. Contractor says, I'm going to indemnify you and carry it across. So it's, you have to kind of follow the lines with the concept of indemnity. Some states, including Illinois, have passed statutes which forbid one party to promising to indemnify the other for the second party's own negligence. So in this instance, this concept here, what's not allowed is, so contractor seeks indemnification from the electrician. Contractor gets sued by a worker that's injured. Contractor is responsible for safety. Maybe the electrician and the work that they did, some of their work was not safe. Maybe they did some other stuff. But the injury, as we've learned, can have more than one cause. 
So the plaintiff is injured. Some of that injury is caused by the contractor's failure. And some of that injury is caused by the electrician's failure. Jury gets a verdict or the verdict to the, to the plaintiff of a million dollars. And the jury apportions it 60% contractor, 40% electrician. The electrician is only obligated, but, but the jury then, but the, the plaintiff, this is another thing in Illinois and other states, the plaintiff can go and collect the money from whomever it wants. If, you're, if anybody's over 25%, he can collect whoever it wants. So the plaintiff goes to the con- general contractor and says, write me a check for a million bucks. The jury told me I get a million bucks, write me a check. The contractor says, but you guys, the jury only apportioned me 60%. I should only have to write you a check for 600000 The law says, no, 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 I can collect it from whoever I want. There's all these reasons why, but just take it in the word here that that's what happens. The contractor is going to look to the electrician, but they cannot look for the electrician for anything more than the electrician's 40%. Because the jury apportioned some of the negligence to the contractor. So, you cannot be indemnified for your own negligence. The, even though the electrician had fault, and even though the electrician said, I will indemnify you, contractor, for anybody's injury, I don't indemnify you for your own failure. So that's how that would be. So the, the, the 60-40 split would be worked out later on between contractor and electrician, even though the elect- contractor has to write the check to the um, injured party. The reason why that's relevant um, Sometimes you're in a case where the electrician doesn't have the money. So the jury, the, the plaintiff that gets injured, wants to go and collect it from the big contractor who has all the money. And then the contractor's like, well, I can't recover. Where do I get this? How do I get my money back? And sometimes you can, and sometimes you can't. But that's why the plaintiff shouldn't be the one that suffers a loss. If the jury says they owe a million dollars, he gets a million dollars. Whether it's from the contractor or the electrician or both or whomever, the jury gets the plaintiff gets the pay. Most of the stuff you guys will never have to deal with. I mean, it may come into your cases, but the lawyers will deal with all this other stuff. But I just want you to kind of, this kind of chain these links of how things go to happen. Okay. Quickly, we're going to do some insurance. Let's see what we got left here. Okay. I think we have like five or six slides in this in that church. Okay. So you're out there, we've now lost, we've, we've talked about all the problems and the drama of you guys, whether you're actually going to be liable or not, and how do you keep in business? If you, I mean, yes, you don't have to be perfect, but you've got to act to the standard of care, but sometimes things don't go right. What do you do when you get sued and you didn't do anything wrong, but you still are in the lawsuit? How do you pay for that? All this stuff is, you've got to cover yourself, and that's insurance. So we have professional liability, sometimes called errors or omissions insurance. That's what you as the architect are going to carry. This is E and O professional liability. Contractors don't carry this type of insurance. Only the professionals carry it. Okay. It provides coverage for claims alleging negligent errors or omissions by the architect. So that's this one. Remember I said if you put in I guarantee your insurance company is not going to pay because it's only going to cover your claims alleging negligent errors or omissions not a failure to perform in accordance with a guarantee or warranty. So that's what the insurance covers. Key terms. Coverage limit. I have a million dollar policy. Then that's all the insurance company is obligated to ever pay out is a million dollars. Maybe two million, three million. So when you putting together a project, like right now I have a, um, I have a project that's um, a $350 million plant. We're going to have the architect carry at a minimum of a $25 million insurance policy. Losses could be greater than that, but the insurance company is only obligated to pay up to $25 million. You'd have to recover your costs uh, somewhere else. It's the maximum amount that the policy will pay on account of any claim. The policy pays for a loss. It also pays the attorney to defend the architect. So what happens in professional liability insurance is I get paid. And it comes out of that million dollars. It's what's called... Um, Declining balances or eroding balance policies. So let's say we start with a project. Let's say you have the architect, you as the architect, design a house, and um, the homeowner, it's a $400,000 house, the homeowner has you carry a million dollar policy. Something goes wrong, 
and the architect, and you as the architect get sued. You call up me. Hand in hand, you've got to represent me. I'm like, okay. Like all insurance policies, you have like a $50,000 deductible or maybe whatever your deductible is going to be. That ultimately you have to pay at the end. I start doing my investigation. I send you a bill. You send that bill to the insurance company. The insurance company pays me. Let's say my first, after like a year of defending you, I've spent $100,000. You had a million dollar policy. Now you only have $900,000 to play the plaintiff off because my fees come out of this declining balance policy. Contractors' policies don't work that way. Only professional liability policies, it's eroding balance or declining balances, that money spent or paid to like an architect or whatever reduce the value of that insurance. The reason why that's important is because you'll want your contract to say, my insurance is the available, the amount of available limits so that the owner knows that, because sometimes you get in a lawsuit where the owner's like coming after you, coming after you, coming after you. Well, that's more legal fees you have to spend to defend it. And every dollar that they, that, that the lawyer takes out of this pool, this million dollar policy, is less money that the owner that's suing can collect on from the insurance company. So sometimes you go to, sometimes all get into a discussion with an owner's attorney and say, you can take me to trial, and when you win, there's going to be like 200000 left in this policy. There's four now, but the trial's going to cost two hundred grand. We can settle for the remainder of the policy, or you can go to jury, you can get your five, six hundred thousand, million dollar verdict, whatever it was, and you can collect two hundred thousand that's left from the policy for the insurance company, and you can try to take money from my guy, but he has nothing. He's got his pencils and his desks and his computers, and the business doesn't have anything. It's a small shop. What do you want to do? Do you want to settle for four that's left now? Or do you want to go to law, go to trial, and collect only two and, and have this pure million dollar variant? We settle. That's what happens a lot. So that's what this declining balance actually helps something that is beneficial to an architect. Deductible. Well, we all know what deductible is. You guys probably, you guys, you know, whether it's homeowners or automobile or whatever, deductible as a concept is if you want the insurance company to pay on the policy, you've got to pay something. It's a deductible going in. A common deductible for just a, a standard average architect is like 50 grand now. So the owner, the architect, pays the first 50 of the recovery. The insurance company picks up the rest. Retroactive date, the earliest date the architect's error omission for which the cover will apply. If I have a policy, I go to Aetna for my insurance, and that policy kicks in January 1st of 2019, and it's for one year. If I get sued in 2019 for a design I did in October of 2018, and I was using the Hartford for the insurance at that time, I can't go to Aetna. Even though I'm sued in 2019, and Aetna is my 2019 insurance company, I can't go to them because their policy didn't start till January 1. I've got to go back to Hartford. I've got to keep that policy in place because that's when the, the injury may have occurred. Now, that's, that's what's called an occurrence policy, and we'll get an occurrence of claims. And the premium here is on the date, the definition is the, how much you pay to keep the policy in place. So, retroactive date is, is, is how far back and forth the, the claim is going to be the pledge. For professional liability, though, when I just gave you the example, I apologize, that's a contractor example, is what's called a claims made policy. There's claims made in occurrence in, in construction. Professional liabilities are all claims made. It's when the claim came in. So, like I said, my example was wrong for architects. It was for insurance. For, con for architects, I did the error in 2018 when I had Hartford as my insurance company. The claim came in in 2019 when I had Aetna as my insurance company. Because if a claims made policy... It's when the claim was made in 2019, I actually used Aetna as an architect. If I was a contractor, I would use Hartford going backwards because it's when the occurrence happened, when the failure happened, as opposed to when the claim's made. That's the difference. So I apologize for that. Does that make sense, though, the difference of when it's triggered? Um, since the claim can be made after a project is completed, the insurance only provides protection if it's kept in place, essentially, 
constantly. You can't go. There's this concept of what's called a tail. I think I have it here. Yeah, architects who are retiring, going into business, may purchase tail policies, which protects against claims arising out of prior projects, um, even though the, no further insurance is being purchased. So this concept of the tail, and you're always going to see this in a contract, is you architects are going to provide insurance for my project. I don't care where you get it. You just got to have a million dollars of insurance. The project is completed and finished in December of 2018. Well, most of the time, the, the owner isn't going to find out if you fail to do your work until after they move in. And maybe it's a year down the road or two years down the road. So the owner wants to make sure that insurance remains in place. So what the contract will often say is you must carry a million dollars insurance at a minimum of three years after the completion of the project. So there's something still there. This tail of three years. Two to three years is your traditional tail in, in architecture. Now, the architect may continue just to be carrying insurance anyway because that's part of their business. And so the tail is just kind of automatic. But a lot of times when you retire, like I said, when it says retire, I'm going out of business, I'm retiring, I'm hanging up my shingle, I don't want to do anything anymore. But two years from later, you don't want to get sued, the company or you individually, and not have coverage. So you keep this tail in place. Um, deductibles are large, 50000 Sometimes, though, I've seen deductibles up to a half a million dollars, depending on the size of the project, the size of the company. Um, and the, the premium is a function of how coverage limits deductibles and claims history. So this claims history concept is what happens, how much your premiums are. And same for you when you have auto insurance. All this is the same. Is uh, State Farm is going to come to you when you want to renew your auto insurance, and so they're going to look at your driving record for the last five years. And they're going to adjust how much they charge you for, based on driving record, age, and actually in, in driving, it's also sex. Like my wife's insurance, even though she's 10 years younger than I, is cheaper than mine. Because men traditionally get more accidents than women. The statistics show that. So they do all this calculation. Same thing happens in architecture. They're going to look to see how many times you've been sued or claims have been made against you over the last five years and adjust what your premiums are for that million dollar insurance policy. So all this is very similar to how the insurance works um, as your own per personal and auto insurance. Claims must be, rewarded, must be reported promptly to the broker or the carrier. So if you get someone that calls you up and says, uh, your designs were defective and, and I'm going to sue you and you get this letter, but then they don't file the lawsuit for a while, call your insurance company and say, I have this claim against me. Because if you don't do it promptly, let's say you get this letter or you get a phone call from the homeowner. You screwed up my house. I'm going to sue you. You did this and this and this wrong. If you don't tell your carrier about that, a year and a half later when you get sued, then you call up your carrier then if they got a lawsuit. They're going to say, well, when did you learn about this? Well, he told me about this claim a year and a half ago. And the insurance company is going to say, you were delinquent in notifying us. And they can actually deny you coverage if you don't report promptly. So that's a, a warning. Now there's this balance of how detailed the claim is and what really triggers it. But the, but the bottom line is, is you want to keep your carrier informed of claims, regardless of whether there's a lawsuit or filed, because they can deny you. Um, the other thing that's going to happen is, remember I said I get paid by the insurance company? It's kind of this odd tripartite relationship, where actually I'm hired by you and by the insurance company. And I def but I owe my duty, even though, the, even though the insurance company's paying me, in this triangle of whether it's insurance company, architect, and lawyer, I owe my duty of loyalty to you, not to the insurance company. I must vigorously and zealously defend your lawsuit, even though the insurance company may be pressuring you to keep the bills down because they're writing the check to me. My duty is to you as the architect, not to the insurance company. Um, sometimes there may be a conflict of interest. If the insurance company tries to insert themselves. Maybe I go to the insurance company and I say, look, I've seen the facts of this case. We got to settle. We got to settle big or we're going to get hit bad. 
I'm only $100,000 into this project, into this lawsuit. I think this could go for like three or four years. I think we need to tender the policy. I think we need to write a check to the plaintiff for $900,000 right now and get this over and done with because if it goes to trial, my client may get hit for three million bucks. Well, the insurance company is going to say, I'm only obligated for a million. What do I care about the other two million after that? Keep defending. Don't settle the case. I think we can win it. It's a claims adjuster you're talking to. So I go back to you as my client. I say, here's what they think. Here's where the problems are. This, this lawyer on the other side is really good. The facts are really bad for you. We all agree you screwed up here. We, I think we got to settle. So now I'm in conflict with the company that's writing me a check. The insurance company's paying my bills. And I'm in conflict because the insurance company says, defend, 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 which means I can make more money because that's how I make money is, is being a lawyer. But the clients, I can settle, settle, settle. I don't want to get tagged for the additional money. In instances like that, sometimes the insurance company will bring in their own lawyer and actually figure out where their balance of interests are, the coverage claim and everything else. Sometimes you have two lawyers defending the insurance company or not. Um, sometimes the policy that the architect will have will have a language that allows the architect to demand that the insurance company make an offer of settlement. So the, the architect, if I tell the architect, the insurance company says, fight, fight, fight. The architect can call up the insurance company and say, I'm triggering the clause in my policy. We must tender. That $900,000 that's left, we must throw that at the plaintiff and see if it works. If it works and they settle, the insurance company writes the check, case is over. If the, if the plaintiff knows they have this big, huge case, they may reject. And then the insurance company says, well, that's just the way it goes. But there are some benefits or there's some elements where sometimes there's a conflict because I'm getting paid by the insurance company, but I owe my duty of loyalty to you. Okay? Practice policies versus project policies. So real briefly on that concept here, I won't go through all the details in here, but think about it this way. Um, you're an architect that traditionally does residential projects and um, maybe you've done some commercial and you carry like a, a policy that's two million with a three million aggregate. So you just, you know, two to three million dollars is your policy. That's your practice. No matter who hires you, you always have a two to three million dollar policy in place. And most of your projects only ask for that, so you don't need something more. Now you come to a project where you're hired, it's kind of a souped up thing. It's, it's a large commercial office complex, it's something special, and, and it's a sweet deal. It's your ability to kind of branch into a new area. And the owner says, I need you to carry a five million dollar policy. Well, the bulk of your work only requires the $2 million. And obviously, if you start carrying $5 million year in and year out, your premiums are going to be significantly higher because it's more than double. So what do you do in that instance? You can get what's called a project policy. So just for that project only, you'll carry the limits of the $5 million, and it's a special dollar figure for that. The rest of your practice, all the projects you're working on elsewise, kind of fall under that umbrella. So you'll find from time to time, and you'll, you should work with your broker, or sometimes there's a business in your company, you have your own risk manager, that you'll need to carry what this project policy is. You need to carry more insurance, but it's on a project by project basis, as opposed to your whole practice. So that's just a concept that you guys will need to, you'll see. And by and large, the majority of you guys probably won't get into this business aspect of it, but some people do. Some people get out, they practice for a while, and they say they like the business side of it, and they start working with the economics of the business, the companies they work for, and these are questions that will come up as far as where their costs are and what the projects are. Or maybe you're the senior lead architect on the project, and you're negotiating the contract with the owner, and the owner says, I need $5 million. And you say, well, we only carry $2 million policy. And the owner says, well, then I can't hire you, so you have to make the decision for the company and say we need to spend the money on this project policy. Um, commercial general liability policies. So, so we have, so all the things we've been talking about now, up till now, is your professional liability. 
your services as an architect, your ability to perform in accordance with the standard of care. There are three other basic types of insurance that you're going to want to carry for every project. One's called commercial general liability. One's called auto. When you're driving that car to the project site, if you get a car accident, that's pretty much the same as your traditional private personal auto policy, but you've got to carry it because people drive to project sites. And then there's your workers' comp employer stuff, which you have to carry by law, employer's liability and workers' comp. Commercial general liability is the second largest collection of types of insurance you carry. Professional liability is the biggest thing. It covers your services. Commercial liability is it covers a claim that is not related to your professional services. Well, how does that work? Someone comes to visit you at your office. Your carpet's got a, it's torn up and they trip and they fall and they hit their head on the desk and they have a head injury. That has nothing to do with your design services for the building that they came to hire you for or to visit you. You want insurance for that. That's commercial general liability. So you carry your standard commercial general liability policy for that. It doesn't arise out of your services as an architect. Now, on the construction side, on the contractor side, almost all of their work is going to fall under commercial general liability, and they have more than just somebody trips on a carpet in their offices, but it comes with that. Question? I mean, this is the same example of the client, so, you know, falls, trips on the carpet. Is the carpet, is the client negligent too? The trips? They could be, yeah. The question is to the jury, is that, are they more than 50% fall at fault? You know, should they have seen the project? Maybe it was the first time they were at the site. They couldn't see it. Who knows why they fell? But you're right. The, 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 injured, the party that got injured, one of the arguments you can make is, is they were as much at fault as anybody else. That's very true. So, um, claims for against an architect are rarely, it's not typical, to come under using your commercial general liability policy. Like somebody tripping in their office, something like that. Um, that's what I have there. Um, architects, another one, another example here is the architect's construction site observer accidentally bumps into someone and injured. So I'm walking down the project site, I'm looking around to make sure that the contractor's doing their job, and I, I turn the corner, I bump into the guy, he falls in and gets uh, spears his leg on rebar. That has nothing to do, even though I'm walking around doing my duties of doing construction observation. When I bumped into the guy that fell down and speared his leg on rebar, that would fall under a commercial general liability policy. So it's just that you wouldn't go to your E&L carrier, you would go to your CGL carrier, say, here, defend this claim for me, pay the check to the guy that got injured. Yeah, I bumped into him, I was negligent or however what it is. So, um, Because it responds to very few risks, because it's really not what you're doing, as, as opposed to the contractor swinging a hammer all the time, they could be negligent and swinging a hammer and somebody gets injured, that's commercial general liability. So, since it um, happens very few times for an architect, CGL insurance is very cheap to carry this. So you should carry it because it's not expensive. Um, in this case, it's written on an occurrence basis as opposed to a claims made basis. So when you bump into that guy on the project site, and it was in January, it was a, and so back this is where my example was on this concept of occurrence. If you bump into this individual and they were injured in October of 2018, that's when the injury occurred. The lawsuit doesn't come to you until February of 2019. If you have Aetna in 2019, but the occurrence happened in 2018 with Hartford for a commercial general liability claim, you use Hartford when the occurrence happened, not when the claim's made. So it's just... And that's what they're called. It's called an occurrence policy or claims made policy. Professional liability is when the claim, when somebody tells you they were hurt. Commercial general liability, when the occurrence happened, when they actually physically were hurt. Not when they bring a claim against you, but when they physically were hurt. So that's the difference between professional liability and CGL. Commercial general liability occurrence, professional liability claims. That's the, one of the big differences there. And the reason why it's actually this is really important, um, not for you guys, but just for the business thing, is, is you'd be surprised how often people change their carriers from year to year to year to year to year. And so you have to sort out who's paying the lawyers, who's playing the plan, and who's going to pick up coverage. Sometimes they have overlapping policies, lots of other stuff. So whether it's occurrence or claims made is relevant. Um, 
When commercial general liability is purchased by the contractor, it's the major source of their protection, as opposed to, like I said, architect, their major source of protection is the professional liability. Contractor is commercial general liability. Um, the, general, the, ar- the general contractor will name the architect and ar- an, ar- an owner as an additional insured. What that just means is um, I have a policy of insurance. An individual is injured. They file a lawsuit and they sue the owner and the architect, but it's really because of the contractor's fault. The insurance company is also going to defend the architect and the owner. They're an additional insured. They kind of like get the benefit of the contractor's insurance policy. That's what additional insured means. Um, provides important coverage for the owner, but its coverage to the architect is illusory, meaning it doesn't really matter too much for the architect because there's very rarely ever the architect, as we said in the previous slide, where the commercial general liability issues are important or come into play. Um, policies cover claims alleging sudden and dangerous occurrence resulting in property damage by others. This is an economic law thing. Don't worry about this last piece here. That was from a different slide that I wanted to use, but th- this is um, the only concept that's saying is that sometimes if, with this economic loss, if there's, this, if there's an explosion, they may pick up coverage. There's some issues of the, the basically what happens is when you get sued, the insurance company's kind of company is going to step in and they're going to say whether they need to cover you or not. I'm going to I'm going to honor my insurance to you. If you're like I said, if you're late and delayed in telling them, they're going to say I'm denying coverage because you're late. They may deny coverage on the economic loss rule. It's it's, it's down the stream. So this case is. If there's actually an explosion and, and it's sudden and calamitous, then maybe they can pick up. But I wouldn't worry. don't worry about that for the exam. Auto liability policies. So you've got to carry your auto. It's very similar to general liability policies, except for it covers car accidents as opposed to if you bumped into somebody in the project site. So it's specific if it's an automobile. Um, they're just commercial versions of what you guys carry right now when you're just driving around. So it's the same thing. But you want to cover it. When you're, when you're out in a business, you need to have auto insurance. Um, and then anyone who drives the construction site, including the architect and the contractor, purchase these policies to keep themselves essentially, and keep them in place constantly. Everybody's uh, firms, whether it's a contractor or an architect, are always going to have either a million or two million dollar auto policy. Just standard procedure of your business. So you've got to factor that in. Builder's risk, that's the type of insurance. The architect doesn't normally pick this up. It's picked up by the owner or the contractor. This is an instance, builder's risk by and large, what this does is it covers uh, losses that aren't related to anyone's fault. It's not construction defect. It's not design defect. But the project site gets destroyed like an act of God. So... Um, like I said, so it covers actual construction work being performed, and the work must be in place. It's purchased by the owner or the contractor, depends on who can get it cheaper. Um, it's not, it's a no fault. You don't have to prove anybody at fault. Danger to the architect that builders risk may pay off a loss and then turn around and sue the architect for having negligent performed construction. I'll talk about that in a second. So here's an example that I had in the project. Think of it this way. I'm an owner. And I want you to build a building for me, and I own the property. Maybe it's an addition to my building. Let's put it that way. That's an addition to my building, okay? So you're doing an addition. I turn over this space on my property to the contractor to build this project site. Now, I have property insurance, and I'm covering my existing building, but this addition is being built. I'm writing a check to the contractor. The project's moving along. It's a million-dollar project. We're $400,000 in. Contractor's doing great work. No problems with it. Architects design, no problems with it. A bunch of kids decide to jump the fence on a dare and they set the place on fire. As the property insurer, because I carry property insurance, they're going to say, well, I got your property, I got your current building, but we aren't, you, you the owner, you're not in control of that project site. There's a fence around it. You're not in control of that. So my property insurance won't cover the loss for that addition burning down. If it comes over and burns my building, they'll cover my building's loss, but the addition, because that's on the construction site, my property insurance is like, we're not paying. Contractors like, contractor goes, this carrier, we're not paying, you didn't do anything wrong, there was no negligence, it was a bunch of kids that jumped the fence and put the place on fire. But I, as the owner, am out 
$400,000 of materials, plus it's got to be rebuilt. So we trigger this builder's risk policy that covers these non, no fault losses that the traditional property insurance won't cover. It's just, a, you could think of it as a gap filler. Architect and contractor have insurance for their negligence. Owner has insurance for its property. When the construction's going on, this is a space that sits in limbo for acts of God or violence or vandalism or otherwise. You know, let's say it was lightning that struck the building and caused it to go on fire. You can get insurance for that. That's what builder's risk is. Now, this thing about this last point here is the builder's risk insurance company may come after the architect. They may say, let's say that it was lightning that struck it and the building started to burn. But had the architect maybe specified a different type of material for the beams, the fire wouldn't have spread as rapidly. So the builder's risk company comes in and writes a check for $400,000 and then they try to recoup some of their losses from the architect because the architect failed in this design. That's rare that it happens, but sometimes it does. But just think of builder's risk conceptually as a gap between whether the contractor and the architect were negligent, no, and a gap, the other side of the gap is that the owner has property liability insurance, but it won't cover the construction site, the walls that are enclosed in by the fence or whatever, that area. It's that gap filler for that type of damage or injury. Um, oh, this is, this is further on. This is what this talk about, subrogation. Subrogation concept here that I have up here, and I'll just go through it quickly, is, is that in the world of insurance, once the insurance company pays for the loss, so the owner is the one that really suffered the loss. I, the owner of the building, of the property and the project, suffered a $400,000 loss. I have a contract with the architect, so I have a contractual claim against them. Once the insurance company pays me $400,000, my losses, I'm not going to sue the architect. What do I care? I've, I've made whole. The insurance company will subrogate, meaning step into my shoes and take my claim against the architect. The concept of subrogation happens in all different types of things, even if it's not necessarily a builder's risk. It could be in commercial general liability or otherwise. They step into the shoes of the party for whom they're writing the check for. Again, a lot of this is, is legal stuff, um, that your lawyers will figure out, your insurance carriers and everything else, companies. But, but know that the basic premise you need to understand for subrogation is once the insurance company writes a check on your behalf, they can step in your shoes. Think of it this way. Maybe, we can, maybe the easiest way to understand it. How many people here have been in a car accident? Anybody here been in a car accident? Sorry, I didn't mean to embarrass you. I've been in many, so I'll just use my example. I've been in many. I've been in like six car accidents sadly, from going back to when I was in high school and driving too crazy on snow and everything else. Um, one time, though, I wasn't at fault. Not the other five were, maybe a couple, but any time. But one time I wasn't at fault. I was driving actually back in from a, from a, a deposition. I was coming down the, 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 the uh, Eisenhower, and a guy sideswiped me and bounced off me. And so progressive was my carrier. And I called him up because I need to make a claim right away because I knew that I needed to do it. So I called him up. I said, hey, my car's all damaged. I got sideswiped. Progressive couldn't believe it. That afternoon, came out, met me at my parking garage downtown. And the guy came, took photographs, wrote it all up. And he had this little machine and he printed me out a check from the machine right there and handed it to me. Wasn't their carry at all, wasn't everything else he got, because I got the driver's license, I got the license plate, and I got their insurance and everything. I gave all that information to Progressive, and they just wrote me a check, and they said, here, go get your car fixed. And so I did. Progressive sued the car driver that hit me. They subrogated my claim, because I was the one that was injured. I got hit by him, got sideswiped, so my claim is against them for negligence. They were negligently driving, they sideswiped me, they caused me an injury. So going very back to the beginning of our lecture today, I have a tort claim against the other driver. As soon as Progressive wrote me a check, I was made whole. Progressive subrogated my claim and sued the driver. That happens in construction. So that's what this is all about here. It happens to build as risk, commercial general liability, this concept of subrogation. Workers' comp? You've got to carry workers' comp by law. People that work for you, if they get injured, 
and they can't sue. They don't sue. Their, they can't sue their employee. They have to use the workers' comp insurance. Interestingly enough, a lot of people don't know this. In Illinois, and every other case that has workers' comp, every part of your body has already a, a dollar figure value to it. So the workers' comp insurance. So if you lose a finger, they go to a book. They say a finger is worth this, and that's your check. That's it. For everything, every part of your body has a dollar value for it. And so the employer has to carry that workers' comp and they have a comp insurance claim, the carrier that does all that. And, and so that's all it works out in. And so they write the check for those values. Now, that's not to say if you lose your finger, you can't sue someone else. You just can't sue your employer. You might be able to sue and recover more money for that. But the value that your employer and its insurance comes from you is just what that workers' comp for your finger or whatever it is is worth. Did you have a question? Okay. Um, so that's just what we're talking about here. Everybody has to carry it. Um, it's ex this exclusive remedy against the employer. Empo it's an employer-employee relationship. You cannot sue your employee or your employer for anything other than what the comp coverage carries. Um, so, um, it's, so that's why it's common for the employee to sue everyone negligently causing the injury except the employer. There's a lot of times like that electrician. When an electrician is injured on the job, the people that are going to be named is the owner and the architect and the contractor, and you're never going to see their own company because they've already settled in a separate action in a comp claim, probably. So the big lawsuit will be everybody else as opposed to the employee, the employer. Um, workers' comp makes it difficult for the parties to have been sued by the employee to bring the employer into court. I can't. Remember we were talking about this indemnity and contribution I can bring in that third party? Well, if the, if the employer had unsafe practices and that's why this worker was injured, but I'm the architect getting sued, I can't bring the employer in on contribution because workers' comp has already settled it out. So that's all the value of it. So there's some problems in the law to remedy even if they're coming after me as the architect. Um, certificates of insurance, that's just a piece of paper that you give to the owner that says, yes, I'm carrying professional liability and commercial general liability and workers' comp, I'm carrying all these things. That's all in the, uh, it's, you have to show, yes, I'm actually carrying it. You have a certificate of liability or certificate of insurance. Um, you want to collect it from everybody on the project site. It's not just the, con it's not just the architect or the contractor, it's all the subcontractors. It's important that everybody working on your project site all carries insurance. A lot of times it's up to the architect to carry that. Um, they have to examine and forward those certificates to the owner and to the construction team. So these are obligations in the contract of who has to pick them up and collect them. And that's it. Any questions? Okay, so next week, like I said, we're going to go through this agency and theories of um, corporations. That's a shorter lecture. Uh, and then I'll have that up. Everything will be up by Monday on the audio. Um, enjoy Houston. And for those that I won't see you then, I will see you in a couple weeks.